Hi, uh, good morning everyone, and to everyone who watch us uh, afterwards in the recording uh, Zoom. Uh, so my name is Dagan, the, junior, the senior MSA for the Jewish Agency, uh, and we're doing another Zoom Live updates about Israel. Uh, and like always, we start with the numbers behind the war, uh, just to see where we are today. So uh, this is February 29th, uh, 2024. 146 days of the war. Uh, we still have 134 people taken hostage, uh, 126,000 people being displaced. Um, again, this number needs to be to keep being um, important to us week after week after week. Unfortunately, we have 1,464 uh, soldiers and civilians that died in this war, uh, addition of six soldiers that died in Gaza in the past week. Um, we have 5,881 soldiers that got injured. And just like we mentioned every week, we're talking about injuries from bombs. So we're talking about limbs injured, uh, which are probably the worst you can imagine. Um, and we know we killed over 10,500 uh, Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Today, uh, we'll be joined by David White from ADL. I will share that honestly, I think uh, we're facing six fronts, um, Israel and uh, Jews around the world. Uh, five of them are in Israel, uh, which is uh, Lebanon against Hezbollah, Syria, the West Bank, uh, Hamas in Gaza, and the Chutz of Yemen. And our sixth front is the anti-Semitism worldwide. Uh, and after four, that in the four or less times that we've met, we gave the state to the thing happening in Israel. I thought it would be only right uh, that at least once we'll deal with the anti-Semitism outside of Israel. And David White from ADL will be joining us today and share what's happening in America in general and specifically uh, in Long Island and the things that ADL and other organizations are doing in order to, to prevent uh, this situation from happening again. And maybe the future will look different. Uh, if we look at the next war, and honestly think that it's it's all of us responsibility. Next week, we're going to go back deal with Israel. Uh, I'll be joined by Nadav Eilon. Nadav was the first emissary of the Jewish Agency in Long Island 10 years ago. Uh, but not only that, Nadav will share with us uh, three things. First of all, they live in Darava, the southest place in Israel, uh, that wasn't attacked on October 7th, but very remote area. Uh, that leaving uh, only 4,000 people, but they already lost more than four individuals. Um, and Nadav is part of a very special uh, SWAT team uh, that were very effective on October 7th. So we'll share his story. And uh, even more than that, Nadav will share about the Jewish Agency uh, and the, thing that, the effort that the Jewish Agency is doing in order to help Israel and help the displaced families and the Jews around the world. So that's for next week. Today, we're going to start uh, the updates. We'll start with Gaza. Uh, and it's very important that all of you will listen carefully to what I'm going to say now. Um, Gaza was a very unfortunate incident this morning uh, when uh, supply trucks went from the Israeli side to Gaza. Um, a lot of Palestinian mob just ride over those trucks. Um, and in one point, a lot of them went towards the Israeli, the IDF that felt threat for their lives uh, and made the regular procedure of making people to stop before they're approaching. Uh, and when they didn't stop, they had to shoot in order to, to make them go away. Um, you will see all over the world media, unfortunately, that the IDF had made a massacre and more than 100 Palestinian dead. And again, please listen to what I'm saying. There's no way that the IDF killed over 100 uh, according to IDF uh, investigate team, the majority of the Palestinians that died this morning uh, died from uh, from the crowd and uh, getting all over by those trucks and from our Palestinians uh, that want to take over those supplies trucks. Uh, the IDF is claiming, and I tend to believe them, obviously, that only 10 Palestinians uh, got injured or hurt by the IDF soldiers. Obviously, this... Uh, this incident is playing to Hamas and Sinar hands. 
Uh, because again, most of the world, uh, countries, Europe, Arab countries, will not wait for the investigation, will not wait, wait for the images or the pictures. We we'll just uh, decided the IDF and Israel is to blame uh, and that we butchered 100 innocent Palestinians. Uh, and it's another reason why we need to go to a ceasefire. And again, I think it's our responsibility to know the facts. We, Israel is not always um, perfect. But again, I told you this is before the IDF soldiers are me. Uh, and my friends, and I'm sure that you cannot you cannot imagine that I will just uh, shoot in a hundred uh, Palestinians that want to get, take food. Uh, just like you can trust the fact that the IDF soldiers did not do it, they just want to push them away from those tanks um, and the situation they were in. So again, uh, look at the world media and what they published, but but try to know the. We need to know the truth. Um, we know that until now. Over 14,000 supply trucks came from Israel to Gaza. Just understand the number. We're talking about a country or a nation or entity that were in war against. Okay, that's nothing less than, uh, than amazing. Um, we saw in the last few days in Gaza more and more uh, protests against Hamas and against the fact that they are taking those supply trucks to themselves and creating sort of a black market uh, in Rafiah and in Gaza, which is, it's not much, but it's something that maybe started to shift the Palestinians against Hamas. Um, military point of view, the IDF is continue to do what it's been done the past four, four months, uh, controlling 80% of, of Gaza um, specific operation in order to kill terrorists and continue with the preparation to the Rafiah uh, mission that will probably happen in the next, will start in the next two or three weeks. Uh, all the preparation close to be uh, over, including the connection with the Egyptian side, uh, bringing more reserve soldiers and everything in between. So again, we talked about Rafiah in the past, stay tuned. It's it's gonna be dangerous and and complicated, but I think it's, it has to be done. Uh, so this is Gaza. Again, not a very good incident this morning. Uh, the conversation about a possible deal is is not complete yet. So, so there is not a lot to, to elaborate when once we have something more to talk about, we'll do it. Now, West Bank, relatively quiet week. Um, let's hope it will be that way. Uh, Lebanon, the northern side, it's escalating every day. More and more uh, incidents of multiple missiles uh, being targeted or fired at Israel. On the other side, Israel is attacking uh, in far remote places in Lebanon. Um, just this week, Israel attacked Baal Bet, which is 100 kilometers inside Lebanon, uh, the farthest that we attacked since uh, 2006. Um, and I will just share my experience as an Israeli. It's not, I'm not an army specialist. Um, in previous conflicts, it always get worse before it get better. And usually when the deal is on the table, both sides try to show they are stronger and the other side has more to lose. Uh, and I think this is what we see now from Hezbollah, which already mentioned a lot of times before, uh, that when uh, we have an agreement with Hamas, uh, they will stop uh, firing at Israel as well. So again, it will get worse before it gets better. And I told you before, my entire family is in the north, uh, and we heard from uh, firsthand uh, this situation. Um, two things worth mention about Israel internal affairs. Uh, I mentioned in the past the recruitment law that is on the table about the ultra-Orthodox Israelis uh, that are not participating in the army um, and in the Israeli game, let's say, that you have to recruit when you're 18 uh, and can declare that they're going to yeshiva, studied until they're 24. In this conflict, the voices for uh, share the wage and the weight of army service is getting stronger and stronger from all sides, right and left, uh, even from the modern Orthodox and the religious part uh, that are participating in this game, let's say. Um, and the, basically the Supreme Court gave the government a month to get back a specific answer and to have this law in order for the, the ultra-Orthodox will not have to be deployed, all of them, just like every other Israeli. Uh, and and it, it looks like it's going to a place when the coalition will make a, like it's a bluff and a deal and will just pass the ball on. Uh, and yesterday, you have gotten the, the Ministry of Defense uh, in Israel of Security and Defense declare that if there will not be a 100% agreement within the coalition, 
it will not pass this law, meaning, and I remind all of us that Benny Gantz from the opposition is part of this coalition because of the war, um, meaning if there will not be an agreement and Benny Gantz have the right to say he does not agree uh, to any law that will be passed, uh, the government will, will probably fall, and it's uh, it's a very big deal uh, in Israeli point of view, and it got us that much closer to a new election in the next month or, or so. Um, and I told you, stay tuned. Uh, it's it's going to be very interesting. Uh, and I know Gallant did it because I think he honestly, he see an opportunity uh, to make a difference, and he was in the idea for 30 years, and he know that they need to be in equality in the, in the West. Um, one more thing that we mentioned last week about the Ramadan that is approaching on, on March 10th, uh, and uh, how many Palestinians Israel will allow to go to Temple Mountain. Uh, one of the decisions that were made yesterday that I think is very important, that the war cabinet, the one that decides, make all the decisions about the war, uh, decided Ben Gvir, our Minister of Security or Internal Affairs, uh, will not be part of this decision. How many Palestinians are going to allow to go to the Mountain Temple in order to make sure that there won't be any that's an irrelevant uh, thoughts and consideration in this decision. Honestly, I think it's the right decision. I think it will help the world and the Palestinian Israel to see that Israel uh, make the decision in the right way and not uh, according to sector and agenda. Um, so again, two big things happening in, in internal affair. And uh, hopefully that by next week, we'll have more to say about an upcoming deal or an agreement to bring back some of our hostages uh, back home. I will just say in personal uh, perspective, last Monday we have four individuals from Kfar Aza. Uh, it's one of the kibbutzim that suffered the most in October 7th and they share their stories. And I would just say that not only is Israeli, but I think it's our responsibility uh, to read those stories and to make sure that the world will not forget them. Uh, so just that uh, all of us need to, to have it in mind. And now I want to welcome David White uh, that will join us. Uh, and again, share about HeyDL, who they are, and some perspective over the things we're experiencing here in America. David, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And um, this feels like full circle for me. I grew up at the Sid Jacobs and JCC yes. in Roslyn. So it's really nice to be able to address in a professional capacity. Um, so to start a little bit about the Anti-Defamation League and what we do, we were founded in 1913 with the mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure fair treatment for all. So we not only work around Jewish communities and fighting anti-Semitism, but also all forms of hate. And we do this in a variety of different ways, kind of the most basic way and something that I think most people see is responding to incidents on the ground. So if you were to report an anti-Semitic incident to our office, we have 25 regional offices around the country, um, a member from our local team will respond directly. We go through every single incident that comes across our desk. We triage it to the member of the team that handles that particular portfolio. My portfolio, for example, is Jewish institutions and college campuses in the New York and New Jersey office. And then we kind of figure out where to go from there, whether it be, you know, working with a you know, a president of a campus or directly with an employer um, or making a statement about a problematic incident that has happened around the community or writing a private letter to express our concern. Um, it really, there is no one size fits all when responding to incidents. Um, another big important piece of our work is reporting on extremism. We have our Center on Extremism, which really focuses on extremist activity from both the right and the left. And they also, the big thing that they do is um, publish our audit of anti-Semitic incidents. Every year, all of the incidents that come into our office are looked at and decided, you know, is this anti-Semitic, is it not? And then compiled into our audit into four categories, assaults, harassment, vandalism and pamphlet distribution pamphlet distribution being things like what happened on long island last year where a group called the goyim defense league distributed very anti-semitic flyers talking about how jews control the media and the government and other aspects um we also have our center for technology and society which monitors hate 
on social media and online and tries to the best of their ability to work with social media companies to try to curb hate on their platforms. It is very tricky when it comes to First Amendment rights and private um, companies and others, but they're doing a very good job um, in terms of being able to work and at least uplift the issues with social media today. Um, and finally, we have our Center for Anti-Semitic Research, which looks at anti-Semitic attitudes, what people perceive Jews in this country, how people perceive anti-Semitism in this country. Every year, they um, publish a um, report about anti-Semitic attitudes. And every year, what we find is that more and more people believe certain stereotypes against Jews, which is where education is really important. It's where understanding Jewish identity and understanding anti-Semitism is so important and where our education work really comes into play. So what have we seen in terms of anti-Semitism, both nationally and at the more local level? So in 2022, we published our audit and it was found that 3,600 incidents of anti-Semitism occurred in the United States, which was a 36% increase from the year before in 2021, and is indicative of a 10-year increase in anti-Semitism across the board. In New York, we had 580 incidents of anti-Semitism in 2022, 80 of which occurred on Long Island. So the positive is that Long Island actually was one of the smaller areas compared to the five boroughs, but there were still 80 incidents of anti-Semitism that occurred on Long Island in 2022. Since October 7th, we saw from October to January, 3,200 incidents of anti-Semitism. So almost the entire year of 2022 in three months, 500 of those incidents occurred on college campuses, 1,300 of those incidents were some way related to rallies either um, calling directly for violence against Jews, calling directly for violence against the state of Israel. Um, and two thirds of the incidents that we have tracked have been directly connected to the Israel Hamas war. And a lot of the time I get the question of, were we surprised in the amount of anti-Semitism that we saw in the last three or four months? So in some ways we were prepared back in 2021, when the last conflict between Israel and Hamas occurred, we saw a 180% increase in anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, what we see when global events happen, hate also rises in this country. We saw it around COVID when, you know, the rhetoric of, you know, the virus coming from China and other aspects led to more hate against the Asian community. When wars and conflicts happen in Israel, unfortunately, the Jewish community is impacted here. I don't think anyone in our office was prepared for the level that we saw. This is a 360% increase in anti-Semitism in the three month span mm -hmm. that we had in 2023 versus the end of 2023 into 2024. And I think for many in our office, you know, I spoke with people who've been at ADL for 10, 20 years. No one expected this. We were expecting a rise in anti-Semitism, but to the level, I think, was a real surprise. And, you know, people ask the why. I think there are a variety of things that we can probably turn our attention to. I think, you know, the lack of education and the ability to easily blame Jewish communities here for what is going on overseas is something that we see over and over again. This idea of collective blame that Jews just walking down the street are targeted with yells of free Palestine or being told, why are you killing people in Gaza is just something that we see over and over again. And it's this lack of education. It's this lack of understanding that Jewish communities are very unique. And it's also a lack of understanding of Israel and this complexity of this conflict and the intentional omission of the fact that Israel did not want to start this war. This was Hamas that initiated this. This is Hamas that is allowing this war to continue. This is Hamas that is holding the hostages in Gaza. And we're, that, that nuance is missing. 
when you see these calls for ceasefire from city councils and from unions and others, it neglects these really important facts. And because of that, people are not educated in these nuances. And it's very easy to then blame the Jewish community for what they believe is Israel's fault. This is the only Jewish state we have. And therefore, 90% of Jews who are connected to the Jewish state and are Zionist are then collectively blamed. Any decision that the Israeli government makes, people generalize to the entire Jewish community. And that is how this hate is built. And the ability for misinformation to be spread on social media is also something very problematic. I don't know. I'm sure the guy and you remember this, and I'm sure many others. Right at the beginning of the war, there was a bombing of a hospital in Gaza. The narrative very quickly was this was Israel. Then the information came out that this was not Israel, that this was a faulty rocket by the terrorist organizations in Gaza. But the damage was done. The misinformation was already out there. And so once the genie is out of the bottle, it's very hard to put it back in. And media and social media and others need to be doing a better job of making sure that this misinformation is not spread because what we find is then it impacts here. Anti-Semitism is risen here. Hateful rhetoric is spread here. Sometimes violence and assaults occur because of misinformation that is spread. And it is really problematic. So what can we do? What are things that we can do to help in the short term, but also be proactive in the long term? First, report incidents. Report incidents to our office. We cannot help if we don't know. And if you're asking yourself, I'm not sure, it's always better to report to us and let the experts decide rather than deciding on your own. I also get a lot of, well, this was already in the news, so I already, I assume someone has already reported this. We would rather 10 incidents come in about the same thing than everyone assume that someone else has reported this to us. The second thing that I would suggest is using your voice to help further legislation and other causes in the government. Call your local representatives and senators and express that there is a need to pass more aid to Israel right now. There is a need to pass more aid for national security grants to make sure that synagogues and other Jewish institutions are secured. Because unfortunately, we live in a time where that is necessary. Never in many of our lifetimes did we think that Things like what happened in Pittsburgh and in Colleyville and others would happen. But unfortunately, we live in this reality. And as rhetoric against the Jewish community is still spread hatefully, we need to be able to protect ourselves. And our government needs to do that through these grants. Another thing that we really need to do is continue to educate. ADL has resources for parents to talk to their kids about anti-Semitism, about what's going on in Israel. We have programs for public schools to be able to understand these. We have a program that's called Words to Action for Jewish teens to specifically have them understand anti-Semitism and how to confront it. We did a really successful program with the Sid Jacobs and JCC earlier in the conflict about this. Unfortunately, our kids and our teens need to be understanding the complexities of this. And it's not about necessarily saying you will experience this, but it's about explaining this is what anti-Semitism is, and we want you to be prepared in case this does happen to you. As we are seeing more and more college campuses become a place where anti-Semitism is able to foster, we need kids to be prepared for what they are going to experience when they walk onto these campuses. And finally, get involved in your community. Be involved in organizations doing this work on the ground. Make your voice heard. If you are interested in certain topics, be involved with ADL and our volunteer organizations. Be involved at the JCC in programs like this. It is so important for us to show up now in this moment. Thank you, David. Um, I have a question. Just to understand, how does anti-Semitism look like? Um, you said there were 80 incidents in Long Island. Can you give us examples of how does it look so people will know if something is... Anti-Semitic anti or not, maybe? Absolutely. 
So, you know, we've seen it manifest in a lot of different ways over the over the past year. One of the things that actually has been new that we've kind of thankfully been able to work with law enforcement and now there's a better understanding is what's called swatting. These swatting incidents at Jewish institutions became much more common starting in the summer of 2023, but have continued. And, you know, what happens is someone will call the police and say, I have a gun in this Jewish institution. And then the police have to come out. They have to clear the building. There's no actual incident occurring, but the goal is to create panic. And we've seen this at a variety of synagogues on Long Island and across the country. Thankfully, law enforcement really understand this. Thankfully, synagogues have really been able to be prepared, but it is a tactic that has been used now. Another thing we're seeing, as I mentioned before, is these flyering incidents. You have these extremist groups that are coming into communities on Long Island and are distributing these flyers in random areas, talking about the Jewish community controls X or the entire media is controlled by Jews and this is how. And the way these groups get away with it is they don't drop them in front of Jewish institutions or in front of people's homes where they know they're Jewish because they're exercising their freedom of speech. But it's still anti-Semitism and it's still problematic and it still needs to be dealt with. And we actually work very closely with law enforcement and they understand that it's protected speech. But the way they kind of are able to figure it out is by getting them on things like littering and other things so that at least they're on record as having committed crimes so that law enforcement and others are able to track them. We're unfortunately seeing a rise in incidents, especially post-October 7th, at schools and at, on college campuses where you have these rallies and you have these um, walkouts and these protests where students and faculty and others are using really problematic phrases. Not everything we see is problematic. We understand that there is protected speech, freedom. We as an organization value freedom of speech. We understand, but it's important for superintendents, for principals, for um, presidents of universities to understand why rhetoric like from the river to the sea is so problematic. Why calling for an intifada is not just a call for a revolution, but rather there is a historical context of, you know, the second and first intifada of killing of thousands of Israelis in suicide bombings and other things as this revolution, but it really is a call mm -hmm. for violence. The education piece is really missing here. And what we're finding is the Wall Street Journal did a very interesting piece where they interviewed students on these college campuses and said, do you understand what you're saying? What river? What sea? Do you know what that means when people chant it and that it means that it it will ethnically cleanse the Jews from Israel? And what they found was, no, I did not know this. We are really missing a key piece of education here that is contributing to a lot of this hate that we're seeing. I agree. Um... We have uh, two more minutes. So just to clarify, if I see an anti-Semitic act, how can I reach out to you specifically or to ADL? Absolutely. So if you go to adl.org forward slash report incident, it will go directly to our office. Every week, we go through every single incident that we get, and a member of our team will contact you. You can also reach out to me directly at d white d w h i t e at adl.org and i will be able to help you walk through that process as well and you are the adl representative in long island you live in yes, long island so i i work yes on long island and manage our campus portfolio as well amazing um first of all thank you david i think it was very enlightening and um i mentioned it again i think the anti-semitism it's another front that we need to face and for what it's worth as an Israeli in the room, uh, the American Jews stand with us and we will do whatever we can here as the Israeli delegation to stand with you and to educate and give all the information that, that can help. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to start addressing more and more as Jewish communities and as Israel. Uh, so David, thank you. Thank and you, you mentioned uh, the incident with the hospital at the beginning. Um, I think we're going to see very similar uh, reacts after this morning. Uh, in a very, again, very similar um, process. 
that the world media probably blame Israel in the beginning, then they realize that it's not only Israel, but as you said, the, the damage will be done. Uh, exactly. so, so just all of us that be prepared to how it's going to look like. Um, David, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, thank everyone, so for joining us. Uh, hopefully that we're going to have a quiet weekend, and we'll see you next uh, Thursday. Bye-bye. Take care.